So I am Julia Howell, and I am the Chief Program Officer here at Toronto Foundation. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. This is one of our signature events in our Learning Exchange Program, and that's our annual philanthropic education series for our fund holders and for the wider community too. Toronto Foundation has been on our own reconciliation journey for a number of years since signing the Declaration of Action on Aboriginal People and Philanthropy in Canada in 2017, we've made it a priority um, to address our long-standing gaps in funding and also to be more intentional about our learning as well as our relationships with Indigenous residents, leaders and organizations. And we've invited others in to join us along the way through events like this one. We think about this work as being a continuum, starting with reconciliation, which is about better understanding the experience of Indigenous people in Canada and the destructive role of colonization. And then with reciprocity at the other end of the continuum, the building of a new mutually beneficial relationship that recognizes the inherent value of Indigenous ways of thinking, being, and doing. This starts with acknowledging that most of us are guests on this land. That's a pretty profound idea when you think about it. And it's a relatively small thing to take a moment when we're hosting a group to pay respect to those who've always been here. Here in Takaranto, we're on the traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. There are many treaties here between Indigenous people that predate our arrival and together were governed by Treaty 13, known as the Toronto Purchase that was established between the Crown and the Mississaugas more than 200 years ago. This is also a place that draws Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island or North America. I've heard Toronto referred to as the United Nations of, Indi of Indigenous peoples and for good reason. We're thankful of our growing relationships with Indigenous neighbours and colleagues and for all of you who've taken the time to join us today. Today's conversation is about innovation and it's about place too. Perhaps it may be the first time you've considered how Indigenous worldview and practices are central to these. Community foundations like Toronto Foundation are place-based, meaning that our philanthropy starts with a local lens. Apart from that, no two community foundations are the same, and so knowledge of place and the ability to develop creative responses to uniquely local issues are pretty important. Toronto Foundation is delighted to include Anama Community Foundation among our family of funds here. Anama is the first community foundation in, in uh, Nunavut, and I believe the most northern community foundation in the world. Um, the population of Nunavut is under 40,000, but there's more than 1,000 community groups there, very few with charitable status. We expect that Anama will be leading the way for the rest of us in philanthropy in figuring out how best to support grassroots groups, how to be nimble and responsive, and how to meet community where it's at. More to come on this later. In the meantime, today's conversation promises to delight and inform us with new and yet ancient ways of thinking about how to meet the needs of community. We welcome Sarah Wolf, Justin Weeb, and Sheila Boudreau in conversation for the next 35 minutes with some questions from you at the end. I'll come back very briefly at the end to uh, wrap things up. Don't forget about the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So in a minute, I'm gonna int introduce Sarah Wolf to get the dialogue going. I had the pleasure of meeting Sarah about a year ago. Um, and um, I knew then that I had to meet her again. You know how these things go. Sometimes an instant connection is made and you just can't stop talking. Um, I first learned about her work um, uh, through, through her starting up seventh generation midwives and innovation itself in bringing a holistic approach, a holistic approach to maternity care. When my first daughter was born 27 years ago in a midwife supported home birth, I didn't think much about the age old practice and learnings that underpin the service. I just knew it was the right way to go. I'm so happy that today seventh generation is going strong and is able to deliver midwifery care to Indigenous residents looking to reclaim control over their births and incorporate traditional teachings and ceremonies too. Since leaving clinical midwifery practice, 
Sarah's had an eye on Indigenous innovators from coast to coast to coast through her work directing the Indigenous Innovation Initiative. So she lives and breathes it herself and recognizes and supports it in others too. An ideal combination to get this conversation going. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Julia. I'm really, really pleased to be here and pleased to be chatting with all of you today. We're going to be a little bit unconventional on how we get things started. And um, I hope you're going to indulge me and I hope you'll enjoy this, um, this little next few moments before we get going and uh, get started. Um, so if you can, I want you to um, take both feet and uncross your legs or wherever you're sitting, I want you to take both feet. And if you can even take your shoes off, take your socks off if you can even as well. Um, but I want you to imagine both feet on the ground, on the bare earth. And then I want you to close your eyes and take a big breath in and then a long breath out. Take another breath in, another long breath out. Big breath in, hold it for a moment. And then as you breathe out, you can even sigh if you're able to. <sighs> and one last breath. And then out. Now breathe, breathe normal now. But what I want you to do is to feel how your feet are connected to the ground. And I want you to imagine that they are directly on the earth. I want you to imagine, like, what does it feel like on your feet? You have bare feet on the ground. Is it cold or is it warm? Is it wet? Is it grassy? Is it sandy? Is it rocky? Or is it muddy? And as you stand there, what emotions do you feel? Wiggle your toes and imagine that you are an extension of the land. You are connected to the land. And when you look around, what colors do you see? What sounds do you hear? What things do you smell? And as you listen deeper, can you hear the ancestors' voices speaking to you? And what are the voices of those ancestors saying? Is there anyone there with you? Can they hear the voices of their ancestors too? And this place that you are visiting, has it always looked this way? Has it always felt this way? And now I want you to imagine this place three generations from now, three generations into the future. It's about 75 years from now. The year is 2098. I want you to feel hopeful. Sometimes that's hard right now. But feeling hopeful, and as you stand there with your feet planted in the, in the land, what does it feel like now? How do you feel? What emotions are coming up? Keep wiggling those toes and extending yourself in that connection deeper into the land. And three generations from now on the land, what do you see? What sounds do you hear? What things can you smell? And as you listen, can you hear the voices of your future ancestors? And what are those voices telling you? So this is our time. 
the past, the present, and the future, they're simultaneous. They're moving through us. And we're all on this same earth, this same place, and the same, same space simultaneously. And so I just wanted to thank you for acknowledging that, but it, it felt um, it felt difficult knowing that we were on a Zoom call, a Zoom webinar, talking about place and space and the intersection of innov innovation as it's connected to the land without actually being on the land. And so I hope, I hope that helps you to feel like you are connected to the land, because that's what we're here to talk about, is that intersection of space, place, and innovation. And from an Indigenous lens, there cannot be one without the other. So <clears throat> this example was, you know, just a, a way to help you understand my worldview and the teachings that I've um, been brought up with. And this is the way that I understand the, the teachings and the ceremony and the practice and how they're always connected into the land. And so my background, as you heard, was in midwifery. And <clears throat> as a midwife, you, you as an Indigenous midwife, it's, it's hard not to start without uh, being grounded in creation story. And of course, there are many creation stories from any uh, number of different Indigenous nations, let alone all of the different um, nations from around the world that come together in Toronto or in Canada, <clears throat> or even on this call here. <clears throat> the creation story that I connect to is the one where uh, Sky Woman is uh, being chased by the bear and she trips and falls through uh, through a hole and lands on this land that's covered in water and she lands on turtle's back and the story goes on and on about how the animals knew that she needed land to survive and the different animals tried to go down to get some earth to try and create this land and uh, all of the animals failed because the, the the water was too deep and they couldn't get down and so the the beaver tried and the you know the loon tried and the you know all of the animals went down and tried and it was the muskrat um who was the last one and they said well there's no way that muskrat can do it, it muskrat's too small muskrat's too little muskrat is too weak um but musket said well, i i still must try and so muskrat went down uh under the water and was gone for a really long time and the other animals started to mourn uh, poor muskrat. And uh, as they were in their mourning, the uh, muskrat came up to the surface and uh, ha had made that ultimate sacrifice and had not survived. <clears throat> but what they found was that little bit of dirt underneath his claw. And he was successful in his endeavor. And they took that little bit of earth and they put it on Turtle's back. And they all danced around on Turtle's back until we made what we know as Turtle Island. And Sky Woman, as she had been falling through that, that hole in the sky, had the seeds <clears throat> for all of the plant life that we needed. And as they danced around the circle on Turtle's back, was able to plant all of the the, the life that we have here on this um, on this land. So that's the creation story I was grounded in. But more importantly was the teaching that I got that every every birth story that happens is a reenactment of that original first creation story. And as we extend it, it's like everything that we create in any given day, I created a cup of coffee this morning, which you, it didn't show up because of my screen, but, um, but everything that we do is that, that reenactment of creation story. And the midwifery practice, as you heard, was called Seventh Generations Midwives Toronto. And it was grounded in that teaching of the Seventh Generation teaching, which is a Haudenosaunee and an Anishinaabe teaching and extends across many different nations. But it's this idea that the, the context and the circumstances and the situation that we see here today is because of decisions that were made seven generations before us. It's that teaching about looking back, but it's also that teaching about looking ahead because we um, we, you know, we have decisions and actions that we are all collectively making today that will have their biggest impact on all our future ancestors seven generations from now. And so with that, I want to acknowledge that uh, I, I normally am in Toronto. I am currently in Vancouver, which is the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and, and, and Tetsuelu nations. Um, 
I'm Anishinaabe by background. I'm from Brunswick House First Nation, which is in Anishinaabeaski territory north of Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie, and going north from there. And I'm just very, very pleased to be here today and with a couple of uh, special guests. So Justin Weeb and um, Sheila is coming in as well, Sheila Boudreau. And I'm going to hand it over to them next um, because they have very deep connections to the land. And so I wanted to just ask them as they come into this circle to do a bit of an introduction of yourself, but just maybe what comes up for you when you think about land and place and space and the intersection of uh, innovation. Over to you. Oh, I go first, sorry. <laughs> thank, you. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for that beautiful opening. It was very lovely and I think it meant a lot to everyone who's on the call. Um, well, I wear different hats. Like there's the professional side. I'm a landscape architect. I'm a planner. There's the personal side. I'm a mother raising three kids on the land that we live here and I'm in the Toronto area. Um, but I'm also someone who um, has always been very close to creatures, trees, like they were my friends growing up. I, I, I live for being connected to nature and that's, I think that comes from, um, I think it's grounded in generations. Um, so I, I, I want to actually just acknowledge that um, we all have ancestors, we all have places that we belong to over many generations. And for me, I think a lot about how I'm <clears throat> the first generation um, settler on my mother's side. She came to Canada when she was 12. I'm actually British by descent because of that. But on my father's side, he's Acadian and our and our generations go back to like 12, 12 plus. Um, and that's why I have Mi'kmaq ancestors because the Acadians married and uh, made families with the, the Mi'kmaq peoples in present day Nova Scotia. Um, I am the seventh generation to the Acadian expulsion, which is something that not all Canadians think about. It's not talked about. Um, where the British imprisoned the Acadians and separated them and 11,000 Acadians were shipped, uh, half of those people perished. And somehow my ancestors on Doucette and Boudreaux side made it back to uh, the Acadian coast is what it's called now near Yarmouth. But it was where we were severed from our Mi'kmaq relatives. Um, there was no internet back then, there was no mail, <laughs> there was no way people it was just scattered everywhere. People were being killed and it was terrible, terrible times. And the tragedy is still playing out in, in the Acadian community too. Um, but it weighs on me as someone who has, has ancestors that are Mi'kmaq. And I think a lot about how the work I do, I mean, I work in the land, I work on water. Um, I need to do better. I need to really think about my practice. How do I decolonize what I do? How can, we think about economic reconciliation and, and that is, is really why I founded Spruce Lab in 2020 was to reimagine and uh, prioritize Indigenous voices, um, my friends, my colleagues, um, our clients in as many ways as possible. And, and so this is very much water, land, I work in green infrastructure. I hate the silos. <laughs> so I, was, I always talk about green infrastructure. It's holistic. It's that's that's an indigenous principle that the western way is now you know starting to embrace in the work i do thankfully i'll just stop there uh justin thanks uh thanks sheila and thanks so much sarah for for opening us up in such a such a good way um um i'm a uh citizen of the metis nation um Born and raised in uh, in my shared territories in the in the place, um, uh, Michif lands, you know the the Métis homeland, but also um, our our relatives uh, uh, from Treaty Six, uh, primarily the the Cree. Um, I'm calling you from my place, uh, which is uh, a couple hours north of uh, north of Saskatoon in the in the woods. Um, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I, I get to look out a window and be surrounded by trees. Um, and I'm sure folks are aware, but and they said, uh, uh, which means welcome. It's a, it's a beautiful day. And it, it's, you know, as taught, it's, it's a beautiful day, uh, when we're here, but 
looking outside, uh, I'm in the midst of uh, heavy smoke um, from from all the forest fires um, uh, across uh, across the northern northern prairies, um, and I'm reminded of of, uh, of a few things. I didn't actually think about talking about this until I sat down here and was looking out the window, and I'm just like everything's so smoky. Um, and Sarah, when I went and put some tobacco out, I was reminded as well that well, it's smoky out here. Like I, uh, um, and uh, first of all, I am that far enough away and it doesn't look like it's going to um, impact me directly. But um, I have many friends and, and peers who have already have been evacuated, who've lost their homes uh, across uh, across northern Alberta and northern Saskatchewan and um, reminded of both the importance of, of the land and our relationship to the land, but the ongoing impacts of, uh, of climate change um, on our lands and territories and how those disproportionately affect um, Indigenous people. Um, but also linked to our conversation here of, of innovation and, and, and both ancient and, and new knowledge, um, the, the importance of remembering practices that we've, we've always had as Indigenous people. And I, I often use this example when I reflect on innovation, uh, and I'm sure many folks are aware of this now. I think it's, it's a much more common practice, but um, the practice of controlled burning, right? You know, this is not a... Uh, it's not a fancy new technology, you know, of burning the land to to uh, for renewal. It's it's important as an effort to renew the renew the lands, but also to reduce um, risks of forest fires, uh, massive uncontrolled fires. But that's not a new practice, you know. Indigenous people, we've been doing this in the prairies at least for forever. Um, you know, I, I often like to read. Uh, old old archival journals and stories, mostly because they're hilarious, the way that um, people described our people. And they talked about us burning, burning the land. And so in a way, it was hilarious, you know? Like, they, they, I mean, it sort of furthered this narrative of us being, you know, uh, uncivilized savages. But but now the sort of recognition of our, our knowledge systems being so important and that relationship and connection to land and understanding um, that fire is an important part of renewal um, is something that now sort of Western science and innovators and all these people are recognizing is so integral. Um, so I'm particularly struck by that today, just looking out the window and um, not being able to see the sun, not because of clouds, but because of uh, because of smoke. Yes, thank you for that. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you for that reminder, Justin, that our, our relatives in the West are are really suffering right now with um, this fire and yeah that this is a direct connection to to climate change and to the impacts that we've had on the environment and not not reclaiming and not you know making sure that we have those ways of managing you know the forests in a good way i actually it reminds me of a place that i i went to visit at a friend's cottage in georgian bay one time and i was asking about the history of the island it used to be a big resort place at one point but pre-contact in it was called blueberry island and the the local indigenous peoples used to do a, a controlled burn on the island this whole quite large island enough for a, a good couple dozen cot cottages on it but they would do a controlled burn on the whole island to keep the trees low so that they the blueberries would come back every year and that was where they went and gathered their blueberries from um so we had lots of, of really good practices um so right now I'm, I'm the, the director for the Indigenous Innovation Initiative at Grand Challenges Canada and uh, going back to 2015 there was a, a summit that was held by the National Association of Friendship Centres on innovation, Indigenous innovation specifically, and the Honourable Marie St. Clair uh, kind of spoke to this idea that innovation, Indigenous innovation, isn't necessarily something that's just new or technological, but that sometimes Indigenous innovation might be bringing our old ways back to a current context um, and to the current time. And so I guess my questions here for you right now are, <clears throat> what are we most at risk of losing by not having those those old teachings right and so you you set us up really well for this just for this conversation Justin like what are those old teachings that that we're at risk of losing that we need to bring forward um so that we can manage this you know space and place in a good way I can kick us I can, I can kick us off run with it a little bit I mean I think 
No, I'm, I'm inspired. Uh, I, I don't think I said this. Uh, I work at the MasterCard Foundation, whatever uh, whatever that means. It's tertiary in the, in the conversation. Uh, but um, um, I guess the, the important part for me in that is that through my work, I'm, I'm fortunate to uh, to spend time, build partnerships um, with, uh, with people, with organizations, with Indigenous young people and leaders across the country. And so I am fortunate to, to see um, people uh, both continuing to practice things in sort of a, in a way that's been barely disrupted. And then also uh, some amazing young people that are uh, tirelessly working to, uh, to relearn and revitalize. And so I'm always in awe of, um, of the young people I, I meet and see who are, who are committed to relearning our languages and, and relearning our ceremonies as um, uh, an essential connection to, to who they are, but also because they, they understand and appreciate the depth of knowledge um, the teachings that are held within within our languages and within our ceremonies, and, and see those as essential pieces of our not just their individual, but our collective um, survivance and our ability to continue to live into the future. Um, our, our knowledge systems, again, held in our languages, our ceremonies, our relationships, are are critical to to our collective future. So, you know, we'll talk about this later, but just like you know, I see. Uh, and I'm fortunate to work with folks that are thinking about um, how do we redefine entrepreneurship, right? How do we think about what um, uh, what a successful business looks like grounded in in, in a um, indigenous knowledge uh, system where profit is is you know maybe the fourth fourth thing on the list, um, where being able to be your full self, where uh, being able to hire and give back to hire your relatives, give back to your community um, are, are much more important um, than making sure you're, you're, you're wealthy. Those, those other things are as important or more important than, than money. Um, seeing people who are remembering our responsibility to our, um, our relatives, the, the, the buffalo. Um, who are working to to make sure that the buffalo are returned to their lands uh, alongside us and and see the importance of the buffalo both from a symbolic perspective of, of what it means for many indigenous people my people uh, included um, the importance of buffalo is everything it shaped our governance system it shaped our relationship with the land uh, but it also um, is a symbol for an a, a, a important piece of our responsibility to uh, non-human relatives that we failed you know as humanity we failed them um, and it's our responsibility to to help uh, make sure that they come back uh, so I, I see everywhere I see um, young people I see our communities I see our leaders um, you know recognizing the importance of our knowledge systems and, and grounding what they do um, in, in those things cool. Now, Sheila, like through your work with Spruce Lab and just your long kind of history of working with the land, how can land-based approaches support us to reimagine, you know, design, and you know, in the context of shared spaces for like a current context? There's um, there's a term that about maybe in I don't know 2017 people were talking a lot about even 2015, place making and the idea of making places. And, and at the same time, there was a growing voice of Indigenous people about why are we not seeing from the Indigenous side, people saying to me as a landscape architect, we don't see Indigenous representation. And why is that? And then this term started shifting. And a lot of people felt, I, including me, uncomfortable with the idea of place making when the place has always been here. Um, and and that and and so it's shifted thankfully to the idea of placekeeping and what and um, the first um, female architect indigenous architect Cree woman uh, Wanda de la Costa actually coined this term and and that really resonated and so the, we now talk about indigenous placekeeping and that this comes in different ways so it comes through play, it comes through ceremony it comes through physical realization of gardens or signage or stories and narratives in the landscape. Um, but it also comes from changing the way we govern and the way we create programs. Um, so I, th I think innovation is an interesting term because there's that innovation to me just means thinking of things in a new way or seeing them fresh with fresh eyes in a new way. And I think that, I think, um, I think you know because of the the need for change, that it, that a lot of the innovation is coming from the indigenous community, including things like um, the well, 
how we design, for example, streetscapes, you know, the signage we have, the places that we have, where is the art, where are the people's voices? And it's not just the place that gets designed, it's the process that goes through the whole thing, right? So that we actually think about decolonizing, indigenizing the practice of um, landscape architecture, starting with, for example, one of our projects, um, University of Toronto Scarborough campus, we're working on the campus farm and, and supporting the overall implementation of the master plan. But we started with thinking about changing the, 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 the introductions, to get to know each other, to have um, traditional teachings like the seven grandfather teachings first, so we can have a good founding foundation to work and build stronger relationships as we go forward looking at the place. Um, and that was, I, I mean, I've been working over 28 years and I've worked on over seven campuses. And I think that was the first time that we started um, a design process with the design team with, with that, with an elder teaching first. Ted Rogers School of Management is another one of our clients and, and they also have been changing and shifting from the community engagement forward. Um, thinking about the truth and reconciliation calls to action for their Indigenous healing garden. And the engagement um, really was guided by Indigenous Advisory Committee first. And so before we put pen to paper, it's about how, what are our values? How do we work together? And then start brainstorming. And, and, it, and the results are just so much more exciting and meaningful and right. Like it's, a, it's not just a place, it's um, it's you're really connected to it. We also think about what does the land want to be, right? And that perspective of shifting what I was taught in school is design something and then sell the idea to everybody, <laughs> right? Where this is a complete shift. Um, when I was teaching uh, students at U of T in landscape architecture about plants, planting design, um, they said to me, I was the first prof in three years of a MLA program to ask them to think about the perspective of living as a plant. Think about what the plant feels, sees, needs. And that is a really big shift. Um, so I don't know, I think innovation is a tricky word. It's like rediscovering or finally giving space to the knowledge that's been here all along. Mm -hmm when I was practicing as a midwife um, within an urban context, I, I felt really strongly that we needed to be able to understand what the, the teachings, the birth year teachings were for being able to support families because we had Indigenous families coming to us looking for ceremony and practices and teachings because they were so thirsty for that knowledge. And, <clears throat> and so I spent a lot of time with the, with the elders and the aunties and the teachers on understanding those old customs and teachings. And sometimes it's like, well, this is just not really relevant to a current context in an urban setting. And so one of the one of the ones that I, I frequently use in as, as an example is this idea that when um, a pregnant when a person becomes pregnant, it's not just that person who is pregnant, it's that family that is pregnant. And so <clears throat> the, by extension, the, the 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 other parent is also pregnant. And there are certain practices. <laughs> there are certain practices that um, must be observed while while you are while you as a unit are pregnant. And one of those practices is that um, the partner is not allowed to go hunting or fishing. And it's this idea mm -hmm. that you're not allowed to, um, or that you shouldn't be taking life when you are trying to grow life. And uh, when we talk about like an urban context, it's like, well, you know, we're not out hunting for the raccoons and the geese that are, you know, ab so abundant within the city of Toronto. And so maybe it's not really relevant. And a lot of urban, especially young people um, who are, you know, expecting their first baby are not as connected to the land. They may be, you know, second or even third generation urban raised. And so those, those connections have been uh, fragmented. I don't want to say lost, but they've been fragmented. But what we were able to do is to understand the context of that teaching around one, well, why were, was a family told not to hunt or fish? Like, how are they going to survive? Well, first, it was around understanding that it was the whole community's responsibility to raise this child. And so by not hunting or fishing, it didn't mean they were relinquished from from responsibilities. It's just their responsibility shifted and became more focused on that child. But it also meant the whole community around them 
needed to uh, support that family in supporting this new life, which is our most sacred gift. And in an urban contemporary context, it, it offered me an ability to share that teaching with young families, um, but to also to frame it in, the, in this way around, well, if you're both supporting life, what are the actual intentions and, and decisions and actions that you are taking that is supporting that life? And what is counter to supporting that life? Are you playing violent video games? You know, and that extends, a, a, you know, a, a context of talking about intimate partner violence or and or just violence within the community and how to protect and save from that. Um, if you are both pregnant, you know, not expecting just that one pregnant person to observe, you know, the no smoking, no drinking, eat right kind of um, observations, but as a unit being able to kind of support those things in a good way and to support each other in that. And the young people were really engaged with this kind of context. So it becomes even relevant in a, in a modern context to take those old teachings and those old ways and bringing them forward to a new, into a new way. And so <clears throat> talking about this urban context in Toronto alone, we know with more recent research that there's probably about 70,000 uh, Indigenous peoples living within the city of Toronto. Of course, Stats Canada is still uh, largely under-reporting by two to four times, um, but it is quite a sizable population. Not the, not the biggest in Canada, but certainly it's, it is much bigger than one would um, venture to uh, understand unless you are familiar with some of the research. Sheila, what, when we're talking again about the place and space kind of pieces and these different kind of intentional practices around connecting to like, what's that perspective of the plant? What does the land want to be? What are the actual impacts that are happening and what are the outcomes of using that kind of a land-based approach? Um, well, I mean, the place itself, I think, has more spirit and it, it, we see it, we feel it. And the, but there's also a, a really strong um, connection that's, I think, re, uh, it's grows, <laughs> to use the word plant grow, um, where the people that are involved in the process also become feeling like more connected and, and even a heal, like a healing. Like the design process itself can be, it's creative. It is my, one of our friends and our advisors, Amber Smith Quayle, talks about art as art is medicine. And so by working and creating um, cultivating these kinds of places connects you. Maybe it's to a green roof. Maybe it's to uh, a pollinator garden reminding us of all our relations, um, thinking about the water that falls from the sky and, and how how do we work, work with nature to heal Mother Earth through things like green infrastructure. But what I think is for us in the work we do, um, it's that at the end of the day, we're on a project. There's a beginning and an end, but we want it to be loved and uh, alive and connected to people and um, forever. So having stories like t one of the participants in our earth tending program, no, I'm knowing, I know that she was helping with the garden ongoing and talked about how healing that was for her. So as an urban indigenous person, um, it was hard for her to have access to green space to do the hands-on work with mother earth. And so we can find different ways through networks, through jobs, through projects, through placekeeping. I think that is just so um, important. Um, and that we we honor that. Um, I, I, uh, I, we, I, in the work we do, I see us as translators. Like we listen, we hear, we try to create based on what we hear. It's not so that it's respectful. And, and I remember a, a story of um, Chief Stacy LaFarm of Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation speaking in a public event um, about when he comes to Toronto, how he, he, he feels like un, unwell because there's a lot of concrete, there's a lot of paving, right? It's not always, you have to find, look hard for some of the green spaces sometimes. And I was an urban designer for six years of the city, so I was like, ah, we're trying. Um, but he talked about how he spoke with an elder, and the and the elder said to him, "Go and hug a tree. You know, when you feel that way, go up to a tree." And and he did that. He talked about how when he did that, connecting to his non to the other than human kin of a tree, grounded him, right? And so that's healing. That's healthy, and and that I think um, is also placekeeping. 
right? That we, we think about all our relations and, and give them he healthy spaces to be coexisting with us. Thank you. Now, Justin, when I met you, you lived in Toronto. You're now living, as you describe, in the bush. <laughs> um, community members have to sometimes make some pretty pretty tough choices, difficult choices, secondary to economic, health, family, education, kind of uh, uh, opportunities or just even needs. Um, what about your relationship to the land um, and that kind of intersection of, you know, what, what, may, what, what brought you to going back to the, to the bush, as you say, and, um, you know, why is it so important to still make these connections regardless of where people are? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. I think, you know, for me, I, um, um, I spent, uh, I spent a lot of time living away. I, I lived in, uh, I lived in Vancouver and Toronto for, um, for almost 10 years before I came back, um, before I came back home. And, and even then, I, you know, I grew up mostly, um, in Saskatoon in the city as well, right? So, um, definitely have a, a very urban, um, urban upbringing and urban experience. I think one thing that I learned, you know, a long time ago uh, about that was that, uh, um, you know, the, when we talk about um, the city, we often, we often sort of like separate the city from the land. You know what I mean? It's like we forget that like, you know, under the concrete is the land. It's still there. You know what I mean? So there is still place and land to, to, to connect to. Um, and, you know, urban, many, many cities, not all of them, but, you know, many cities in, in Canada there, if you understand the, the origin story of, of the city itself and how it came to be, it's, it's often connected to, to indigenous um, places of gathering or, or trade routes. Like it was, you know, it was settlers responding to our, um, the ways in which we already were in relationship to the land and how we gathered and convened. So I think there's also something in the in the context of urban spaces specifically about um, remembering and, and recognizing um, the the fulsome truth of, of the place um, that, that the city operates in and, and that it's it's much deeper than just the concrete that's that's poured over top. Um, yeah, and I think for me, I, yeah, like, it's connecting you to this bigger question, right, of, of um, where and how uh, uh, our people decide to live. And, and sometimes they're not real decisions. I'm, I'm in the midst of, midst of, uh, uh, of reading a book um, um, that looks at the history of road allowance, which is like a thing that's primarily a Métis thing, um, um, where we were basically living, we were forced to live on the road allowance, which was basically like 12.12, 12, 12, 12.2 meters or something like that, a uh, side where a road would be built um, because we, we weren't able, we, we didn't have another place to live, but you know, it's an aside. But anyways, um, so that is, is our people uh, were, were dispossessed and then were forced to live on those places and then were dispossessed again. And this is not a, a unique meeting thing, but it's, it's happened to many of our people, this like forced dispossession and, and uh, relocation. Um, and we see it, we see it today in, in, in other forms, right? We see it as I was referencing earlier, you know, people are being evacuated from their homes in response to, to, um, you know, forest fires and the, the impacts of climate change. That's going to continue to happen unless we really, really, you know, work to, um, to mitigate and, and to reverse, um, certain things. We also see it largely as, as an economic reality, right? When our communities have been so under-resourced, a very, um, uh, homogenous um, economies and are often reliant almost exclusively on on resource extractive industries um, in many rural and remote indigenous communities. You know the economic opportunities for people to um, to stay home is, is is difficult, and people are forced, you know, too often to make really difficult decisions about staying home and staying connected to your relatives and to your land and to your ceremonies, or or moving and getting a job. Um, and I don't think that's that doesn't have to be the case. And I think there's lots of um, interesting and exciting work that convergence. I think of of integration of technology of the internet, but with you know indigenous knowledge and, and ways of being. Where I think you know if we actually see things like you know the internet as a human right and, and these sorts of uh, um, more contemporary uh, questions about rights, um, it, it can be a way for our people to make sure that they have the opportunities to to launch successful businesses, to, to, to get, you know, formal education from, you know, a university and, and get employed in a different place, but still be home and still be connected um, to their lands and to their elders and those sorts of things. And so I think, um, 
I think there's there's tremendous opportunities for us to really think about what do uh, a future where um, people have real real choice um, and aren't forced forcibly dispossessed, whether it be through literally you have to leave, you're not allowed to be in this place anymore, like, you know, largely my people were during the road allowance, or this forest fire is going to burn down your house, you have to leave, or there's no employment opportunities, you know, if you want a job, you have to leave to not be able to decide where they want to be um, that's going to going to fulfill them and going to allow them to thrive and be successful and prosper on their own terms. That That's a real choice and that people have real options. Uh, I think it's possible and there's really exciting work um, and many different dimensions that are, I think, are helping make this a uh, more uh, fulsome reality. Yeah, um, you, re you, you remind me of my favorite, you know, Cree Métis elder and teacher from Saskatoon area, um, Maria Campbell, who would remind me and often reminded us at the practice that a hawk in the city is still a hawk. And it extends to whether it's just around our identity or to even just like the city um, is still the land. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to stick with you for just another second because you were segueing us into these kind of future kind of, um, you know, what does the future look like? And so when you look two to three generations into the future, what does community look like for Indigenous peoples and how are they connecting to the land? What does an Indigenous economy look like? Yeah, well, I think those are, I know some of those are massive, massive questions. I think it's, uh, you know, I, I get excited about it when I when I think about the future, um, and largely, you know, when I have conversations with people who are much smarter than me, doing much more important things than um, than what I do. But is um, is uh, and I, well, something that I was referencing earlier, I was I was speaking about um, um, the economies and entrepreneurship, and you know, I. I I'm fortunate to have worked closely with um, folks at Entrepreneur. If it's an uh, Indigenous business accelerator, but do a lot of different stuff uh, focused uh, across uh, across the Northern Territories. And you know, it, as much as it's about the the training work that they do, the you know business accelerator and incubator, the you know whatever business development services that they provide, the access to capital stuff. You know, all that stuff is important and really matters. Uh, but the stuff that I think is like truly visionary is when I when I hear them talk about um, the future of, of, of the economy in the north and in their territories and that that is something that's that's regenerative that's something that's cyclical that's something that um, truly centers our, our, our knowledge systems and, and all our relations with whether that be again um, other human beings but the lands the waters the, the animals and the plants and that we can think about um, economies that actually um, regenerate rather than extract uh, and I think that's largely what our, our our society has been has been structured around around extracting of whether that be you know resources um, or knowledge or whatever it is the extraction of something and the and the selling of that for a, for a profit that we can actually flip that and work towards uh, economies that value and um, regenerate and rebuild. And so when we have to talk about that, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, I think is super exciting and it's, you know, is awesome. And I can to another organization partner I was referencing earlier, um, it's working on Buffalo uh, Rematriation, the International Buffalo Relations Institute, where in a similar way, the future where, you know, they're envisioning is one where um, the Buffalo are, are, are freely roaming, you know, across the Canadian American border um, and if we, and folks who know, and I've learned this again from them and people much smarter than me, the role that the Buffalo have played in shaping the entire prairie ecosystem is fundamental. The, you know, the things like the way that they would scratch the ground as they ran, you know, and what that would create, the seeds that would get stuck in their fur as they moved would, would move plants. Um, you know, the way that they would lay on the ground and, and, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but they would sort of bury, um, uh, like holes almost into the ground and water would pool there for other animals in, in drought. So like there's all this thing that like, Buffalo are these m such an important species to the creation of the, of the prairie ecosystem. Uh, and then we, you know, as a, as a, as a, as humanity, uh, basically killed them all off because they were inconvenient to us. Um, and so, you know, to see a future where that relationship again is revitalized and, and to understand the connection between, um, um, the ecosystems and, and the animals and us. Um, so those folks in particular I see as ones who are like, have that vision and are building towards it. And when I when I close my eyes and, uh, you know, and uh, hear the buffalo running on the prairie again, 
um, you know, are things that I imagine or uh, where when we talk about profit, it's not inherently just about money. It's also about um, how we've rebuilt something. Amazing. And what about you, Shayla? What do you see in two to three generations in the future as we kind of connect to what, you know, what does the community look like for Indigenous peoples? What does it look like for the land? I, I think that um, from the work we do and over the time of even my practice and that it's so um, in the future, what I see is Indigenous people having a voice and having a choice in directing and guiding the way the decisions made. Um, I, I, I do see people trying harder to understand treaty, to understand traditional territories. And I think in the future, um, we will see Indigenous leaders alongside uh, the governments of today or in the future collaboratively making decisions, but as sovereign and uh, people understanding what that means. And there's a lot of confusion currently and what does it mean to have duty to consult and what does consultation with First Nations mean versus Indigenous engagement of people who happen to be Indigenous in the area. And I think that our, our, the settler, our settler knowledge base needs to come up. My, I see in the future it will because people are asking good questions. They're watching things like this webinar they're reading books and educating themselves. And, and I think what the future for me is that sense of pride and uh, uh, belonging, uh, like indigenous youth, you know, um, feeling that they, they are welcomed, um, that all people, I'm just thinking of youth because I had heard about um, uh, youth in Toronto, particularly feeling that they don't see themselves represented and they don't feel valued. And, and I think it's changing because of the way we're all working hard to change it uh, and alongside Indigenous voices. So we're not, like I feel very uncomfortable being here speaking as someone of Indigenous ancestry and I'm not Indigenous, but the people I work with aren't comfortable yet to be sitting in this seat. And and I find um, some, Jody Wilson Raybould actually, I took out this book here because I wanted to share this, The Truth, True Reconciliation, How to Be a Force for Change. She talks about the need for in-betweeners and the people who are helping to move in the right direction. And I think all of us have roles to play. And I think that right direction in the future is where we don't have to have webinars like this. We just walk out and, and we, we see the first peoples of the place. We hear their voices and they're in positions of making decisions about um, what happens on the land versus being brought in late and saying, well, I didn't understand, you know, and that's currently what's happening. It's like, we didn't know you had rights. Well, that's not acceptable anymore. <laughs> um, someone's asking if you can hold up the book again, but it's Jody Wilson oh. Rachel, True Reconciliation. Um, it's her her latest book, um, which I also have a copy of. And uh, I love that kind of phrasing of, of in-betweeners. Uh, can you believe how fast this conversation has gone? And the hour has gone by already and uh, we're getting prompted because um, Julie is back. There's a question I saw on the Q&A, but there's, um, there's, of course, I've got like, you know, a few more questions I wanted to get through, but we will not have time to get to them. We have about five minutes left, but um, I'm going to just quickly ask um, if you can, like, in a short answer, like, what are the main things that you want the to tell the Toronto Foundation community, which is made up of, you know, more than 900 philanthropists and numerous, like, countless other um, people who are connected. We have, you know, we've had like over 100 people even on this call at various points during the day today. So the people are really interested. What do you want to tell this audience? And then we'll get to the question in, in the in the chat. Go ahead, Justin. Go oh, first. Um, I think for me, I like the the, the simplest thing is um, that uh, Indigenous people uh, we have solutions uh, to the the problems that our people face. I mean, it, it may not be obvious, but it's it's still wild to me how often I'm in conversations where. Uh, people forget uh, to ask the people uh, who are most impacted by something um, what their perspective is and what their needs are. And and that I, I'm fortunate in the work that I do that I, I really work to support and invest in uh, Indigenous young people and um, um, nation building and self-determination. And, and so, you know, I see it firsthand every day 
um, our young people, our communities, um, building the solutions to the problems and challenges that they face and their communities face, but but even beyond that, that our, our society um, faces more broadly. So um, yeah, don't forget that we have answers too. What about you, Sheila? Yeah, it's sort of similar. I would I would encourage you to to support indigenous led work and listen deeply to what you're being uh, what people are sharing with you, um, and and also think about and check check what you're doing and think is am I doing what are my intentions and in why I'm doing what I'm doing, is it extractive? Am I asking something because I want something, or am I supporting what others with indigenous peoples, many different nations across Canada? you know, what is it they're asking me to do and, and shift your view to being one of uh, relationship building and being reciprocal versus, you know, what do I need to do next? It's, it's a long, you're in it for the long game. <laughs> Julia, do you want to ask that question? Yeah, um, thanks, Sarah. So um, Georgia from BC had an interesting question about the future. And um, she's wondering about Indigenous innovation in the context of the digital realm and whether there are some interesting models or thoughts that you might have. Justin, you work with youth a lot. You probably have a good answer to this one. Increasingly less and less youthful and further and further disconnected from, I think, technology. And where it's going. Um, yeah, I, think, I think there are some awesome, um, some really cool efforts. I know folks like friends of mine who like um, are making video games, you know, that are uh, um, uh, where people are using like video games to like relearn language um, or um, uh, I'm trying to think of what, what else like really cool stuff. Um, sure, I saw, I saw that. I don't know anything about video games, to be honest. That's even what I know less about. But I, I saw some people that are posting on uh, what's that blocks game called again that everyone kids always play. Someone's gonna know what I'm talking about. Yeah. What? Minecraft. Uh, Minecraft. I think it's Minecraft. Maybe it's Minecraft. Um, <laughs> On Minecraft, Roblox, I think maybe it's that. So I think there are people, like, people who are um, um, uh, like indigenizing virtual spaces and are, and are finding ways to practice our cultures in those spaces. I think it's, there's lots of questions. Um, there's a, a book by a, a professor at the University of Toronto. Um, I, I think her first name is Jennifer. I'm blanking on her last name right now. Uh, but she wrote a book that looked at um, indigenous knowledge and, and yes, she was going to have books on hand, um, which, is, which is a good read about reflecting on, yeah, what does indigenous knowledge mean in, a, in an increasingly digital world and virtual world? Um, there's some really interesting work too. It's not quite this, but but thinking about um, data and intellectual property as it applies to indigenous knowledge systems and and for, for some folks who know, and some, some may not, but in many of our communities, our knowledge systems, there's there's knowledge that's available to all, and there's knowledge that's not. Uh, and and in a world where that knowledge is largely translated by relationship and communication, it's 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 easy to it's more easy to manage that. But in a digital world and an increasingly open sort of world, it becomes a little bit more challenging. And, and people often feel entitled to all knowledge systems, um, and and that's a little bit counter to our I think to many of ours. And so thinking about how um, uh, how we think about what knowledge is available to who in, the, in a digital world and, and what are the ways to um, unlock that for, for the folks who are who are rightfully able and should be able to access it. So um, I have a few questions about, about some of those things as we, as we move into the future. Yeah. Just very aware of the time we have to wrap up, but just mm -hmm. put in the chat um, for people that are on the, watching the recording. Anna Mickey has a new um, publication they also put out online called uh, Data Back, which might also be of interest because it's like a lot largely talking about what um, Justin's referring to in the data sovereignty space. Uh, I know we're out of time. Julie, I'm handing it over to you to close us up, but just thank you so much, Justin and Sheila. I really love having this conversation. I'm so sorry we can't be in person to do it, but um, I wish all of the audience that were here uh, with us today um, a really wonderful day. And thank you so much for joining us and listening to our our, our stories today. And uh, just really grateful to the Toronto Foundation for inviting us to go on this journey. Well, gratitude right back at you, um, Sheila, Justin, and Sarah. This has been awesome. I, I, I regret we don't have more time because I feel like we've only just gotten started. 
Um, and uh, uh, But I have to wrap up immediately. People have other Zoom meetings to go to. Um, we're going to be following up. Um, first of all, with uh, um, with a link to a survey, we really value your feedback. Um, please do take a few minutes to fill out the survey. We're going to send you a um, link to the recording and um, some of the resources that people have requested. So um, thanks all for joining and um, we will be back, no doubt about it.